Hello everyone. Derek Verfa back again on the Typologetics YouTube channel with my wife May. We're finally finishing up uh, Genesis chapter 3 after a long slog through it, part of our study, uh, history, uh, science, history, and scripture. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's open with prayer. Father, please grant us opportunities for uh, spiritual growth and for sharing spiritually with others in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, so last time we looked at the end of Genesis chapter 3 at the man and woman being expelled from the garden. God places cherubs and a flaming sword to the east of the garden to guard the way to the tree of life. And uh, obviously the presence of God. He came walking in the garden to find the man and woman. It was the place of fellowship with God and the tree of life, as I said, symbolizes God's provision for life. And so them being cut off from it leaves them, of course, in a, in a situation of spiritual death and of physical decay and death as well, which is a, a, a sign of the spiritual death having occurred. So I made the, the, the point that when you read the story where it says, at the east of the garden, these uh, cherubs were stationed and a flaming sword turning this way and that, that it made no sense to ask, well, why couldn't they go around just and, uh, and come into the garden from a different direction? Because this, again, is history with a figurative slant. As I said, the east had symbolic associations because invaders and raiders into the land of Yahweh, into the land of Israel, all of which was in a certain sense holy because it was set aside for uh, God's purpose for his people. That was the direction of invasion uh, and the direction from which raiders and invaders would come in. So it had those associations to it. But the two cherubs, as I said, cherubs are spirit guardians. And we looked in Ezekiel where these cherubs are shown with a God enthroned above them, if we were to read that whole chapter and, and gone on to read chapter 10 of Ezekiel, it says that these cherubs had four faces. They had the face of a man, lion, bull, and eagle. They're sort of composite figures. And that went along with the way that they were represented. They're, they're represented as these um, uh, composite figures of these certain powerful animals across the ancient Near East. So, for example, sphinxes were a, a form of spirit guardians. A genii, where we get, you know, genie in the lamp, that kind of thing, or the genii were actually spirit guardians. Lamassu, uh, between Egypt and Mes Mesopotamia, there were names for these uh, creatures. But they were guardians more than they were messengers, which is what the term angel means. But the them guarding the way, this entrance, to the presence of God and his provision for life. Let's look at how that emerges again. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 24, and you'll see them. We already, as I said, uh, saw in Ezekiel, uh, when Ezekiel had this vision of God coming on a sort of a, a throne chariot in the, in the sky is the way it's usually talked about. But if we look at Exodus chapter 24 and, uh, excuse me, chapter 25, I'm sorry. Um, so May is ready to read for us here. Chapter 25. Chapter 25 of Exodus, when it talks about making the Ark of the Covenant. This would be in the most holy compartment of the tabernacle and later the temple that pictured uh, God's holy presence where only the high priest was allowed to enter once a year. So, uh, look at, let's read verses 17 through 22. You shall make a mercy set of pure gold two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. 
You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat and their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from, the be from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Okay, so notice God says he would speak with Moses from above this mercy seat, which is the covering of the ark. So it's like it's a box with a cover. The cover is called a mercy seat, and there were these two figures of cherubs with their wings sheltering the, the cover to the ark and that God's presence would be there above the seat and above the cherubs and that's where the priest would sprinkle the blood in order to present it to God, to give it to God on the Day of Atonement. Let's take another look at poetic representation of this because of, of course this was symbolizing something about the power and majesty of the uh, uh, supernatural attendance to God, uh, trying to communicate something of that into the human realm for us. So let's go to Psalm 80. Psalm 80 and verse 1. So maybe verse one. If you, yeah, yeah, verse 1. Oh, give earth, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. Okay, so you notice it says, you who are enthroned above the cherubim. Okay, so cherubim is just a word for cherubs. It's just the plural in Hebrew, that, that I am plural. Uh, so the cherubim, God is enthroned above them. So this is talking about his heavenly glory and the ark was was representing that symbolically in the temple. Uh, another one, let's turn to Psalm 99. So just over a few pages. So again, Psalm 99 and verse one. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble he is enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Okay, so once again, he's enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. In other words, he's enthroned above the, these powerful beings. He has these, these spirit guardians that are uh, uh, of uh, tremendous power, uh, and yet they are underneath him in, in many different ways. But they are, in effect, screening in a way off direct access to God and representative of his power expressed toward creation. That's why it says, let the earth shake, shake uh, beneath his power. What would it mean? So you've got these two cherubs and this sword that's turning one way and another. Well, what would it mean to try to gain access? In other words, what, what if you tried to simply walk through into the holy presence of God back there as it's represented in the garden. Well, let's take another, yet another scripture about God uh, being enthroned above the cherubs and we'll find out. So this is in 2 Samuel. So 2 Samuel chapter six. So 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we'll first of all read verse 2. Okay, Second Samuel 6, 2. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Be Beal, Beali, Beali Judah. Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. Okay, so they're going to bring the ark. They were going to attempt to bring the ark um, from this place, um, Be Beali Judah, uh, to Jerusalem. 
so that it could be there at that city, the city of David, where eventually the temple would be built. And in bringing the ark, it invokes the Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the, the cherubim. So the ark had a representation of the cherubim, and here it's talking about what that did represent, the actual heavenly majesty of God. They're sort of, it's, it's blending the two of them, the representation in the ark and the actuality that's invisible, uh, you know, the, the in invisible spiritual majesty of God and his invisible glory that is invisible to human beings, but represented to uh, represented in the human realm. So now what will happen if you transgress? What will happen if you try to, were to try to in effect go through the flaming sword? Well, that's right here. It's in verse six and seven of Second Samuel six. So May, could you read that? But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down, for there is irreverence. For, it struck him down there for his irreverence. For right. his irreverence. Struck him down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Struck him down. For his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. Okay, so sort of kind of a well-known incident, kind of disturbing incident. This man, Uzzah, who's helping to bring the ark, attempted to steady it. No one was supposed to touch the ark except the priests that were uh, carrying it or the, or the Levites that were assigned to do that. He uh, uh, seemingly, with good intentions, but with careless regard for the regulations and the law about uh, touching the ark, invades that holy space. This is the equivalent of trying to go through that flaming sword and it comes down on him and he's struck dead instantly. So if you want to say, well, you know, if you want to look at an instance, what is being represented by that a picture of the flaming sword and the two cherubs, you have it right here. The ark where it was represented, he violates that holy space and he's immediately struck down as it were by that, that sword uh, guarding the, the way to the holy presence of God. So that's why I say this is uh, history with a figurative slant because that holy presence of God, that's why you read elsewhere where people are afraid to look upon God face to face. Or God says, as to Moses, that no one may see my face and yet live. The word face in Hebrew is also used for a person's presence because when you're in their presence, you're looking at their face. So uh, you, sometimes when even when you read the word presence, it's actually the Hebrew word for face. Um, and, and so the, the people being uh, af afraid to be exposed directly to the holy presence of God, that's all being uh, re represented in that picture in Eden of that, uh, you know, that, that guardianship, the forces guarding the way to God, and which must be lifted by some extraordinary set of circumstances that would take the weight of sinfulness off human beings to allow access to God. And of course that gets into uh, Jesus Christ and his atoning work, his mediatorial work. And we've discussed that uh, in, in uh, uh, other studies, uh, like uh, if you look on uh, Thoughts on Atonement, you can find more detail about that. So uh, that sort of gives us an idea of what is in the invisible that's being made visible by things like what we're reading in Genesis chapter three. So that brings us to the end of three, but we could wrap up before we go on into uh, the next couple of chapters. And we've sort of, if you remember, we worked our way back through the kind of the flood story. Then we sk skip back and sort of working our way toward uh, Genesis five right in there is kind of how we've been closing in on that part. But if we look back on chapter three with the serpent, the struggle between human beings and uh, snakes, which evoke in most people sort of a fear and loathing 
and which represent a genuine danger uh, in many cases to human beings, which are also a perfect picture of evil uh, uh, creatures on not just an animal level, but a human or even superhuman level, because the idea of poison coming out of the mouth, that is makes a perfect picture of people who spread lies uh, incite uh, others to evil acts or that kind of thing. It's a, a type of poison that comes out of the mouth. So that is why it makes that so symbolically effective, as it were. So we've got the uh, Adam, the founder of the human way, race, his bride. She's the mother of all the living. And all of that imagery emerges again just to review a little bit, in Revelation, let's quickly go back and remind ourselves. So we go to Revelation, and if you remember in 19, we saw the introduction. We're not going to read all this again, but if you look at Revelation 19, we find uh, the, uh, the Lamb and His Bride. So that's in verse 7, you remember. So there is the second Adam and his bride, which is the church, uh, the mother of all the living. That picture, this is sort of forward looking, the, the church looking forward in history toward the eternal kingdom. When we look back at covenant history, we just go back to Revelation chapter 12. So in Revelation chapter 12, there we have kind of looking back at the, the situation of Israel as the covenant people. We have the woman who bears the child, who's threatened by the serpent in verse 9, representing Satan. And finally, in verse 17, we have, uh, May, if you could read verse 17 of 12. So the dragon was in, in rage with a woman and went off to make war with the, the rest of her children who keep the commandment of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Okay, so this is, so to speak, the uh, older covenant represented as the mother of all those who are given life through Christ Jesus, that is uh, eternal life, the prospect of eternal life, not actually having immortality as of yet, but having the promise of life and the active uh, spirit of God giving them, giving life to their heart, to their metaphorical heart, so to speak. So uh, these, these various symbolic images of this history with the figurative slant are sort of brought out specifically and fully in Revelation. And so we have that, you know, striking the serpent in the head as the way that you kill a snake uh, is uh, the application of that is evident here from Satan being represented metaphorically as that serpent. We might just say also that the idea of the serpent or dragon being uh, killed by being struck in the head, as Genesis spoke about, is something that if we turn back, um, again, this is a little bit by way of review, but to Psalm 74, you might remember this. Psalm 74. Mm -hmm. um, so it may, if you want to read verses 12 through 14. Yet God is my king from old, who works deeds of deliverance in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monster in the waters. You crushed the heads of the Leviathan. You give him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. Okay. So this is, it's kind of creation imagery, but it's imagery, it, this was common throughout the ancient Near East to picture primeval chaos, the chaos out of that there was a sort of chaotic situation in some sense out of which creation emerged that's represented in Genesis as the formlessness uh, of the earth in the beginning, the darkness um, on the waters, the waters of being the waters of the abyss, the, the primal ocean, uh, that were representative of, of kind of danger, uh, not necessarily uh, always looked upon as being uh, pleasant or life-sustaining. And it says that you uh, broke the heads 
of the sea monsters crush the heads of the Leviathan. So that's reminiscent then when we get to Revelation of the fact that the serpent dragon in Revelation 12 has seven heads. <laughs> and it's, there's sort of a comparison between God having overcome primeval chaos in order to impose an order of creation upon it, that there's kind of a moral chaos that is unleashed and which had its effects in the human realm that we saw with the man and woman, uh, the first ones in God's image, that there was kind of a moral chaos that was released and a historical chaos and that God tames that also and of course the ultimate agent of that chaos who's spoken of as being Satan by the time we get to the end of the Bible, it sort of uh, 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 clarifies that down to the prime agent of that moral chaos is finally exposed and then dealt with. So uh, we can, you know, it's easy to see once you look for it, the story of Genesis 2 and 3, all of its symbolic elements being clarified and brought forward in the rest of the scriptures as a way to look at the unfolding of human history. All right, so all that takes us to the end of Genesis 3 and then getting into Genesis 4, which we won't spend a great deal of time on. Uh, we know the story, most of us, of Cain and Abel, uh, but let's go ahead and uh, let's uh, read in verse 4. Let's read verses 1 through... Seven. Now the man had relation with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the f firstlings of his flock and of their f fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, Will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Okay, so a couple of things about this account. First of all, you'll notice where it divides Cana and Abel between a keeper of flocks and a tiller of the ground, between farmers and herdsmen. Mm -hmm. So when we'll get later into Genesis, for example, it will uh, give a note that the Egyptians uh, looked down on those who uh, herded animals as opposed to being farmers, as most of the Egyptians were. It says that they were, uh, they, they were lo looked down upon by the Egyptians, I forget the exact word, but... And there was a tension in the Middle East in general between, uh, for example, in Mesopotamia, the city dwellers who depended on farming, uh, that the, the farming land would be outside the cities and support the cities, the city-states, their armies, and so on. They looked upon nomadic herdsmen as being uh, uncouth, unlearned, somewhat dangerous, as living on uh, the fringes of civilization, as we might think of it, as being sort of... Uh, uh, barbarians, uh, you know, if I could put it that word, or, or, or being uh, always potential, potentially raiders, uh, kind of, you might, if you think of gypsies or the Roma, you know, as they're now called, how they have a reputation for moving from place to place. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that, that this is necessarily deserved or trying to uh, say that this is all historically based, but, you know, gypsies were uh, stereotyped, uh, let's put it this way, as being uh, thieves, mm. as being uh, 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 cheats, 
uh, maybe not all the time, but that easily their sales activity could be leavened with uh, you know cheating and a certain amount of fraud and that kind of thing. They would not stay rooted in one place, but move from place to place. That's the way that uh, that herdsmen were looked upon by these more settled city-dwelling peoples in both Egypt and Mesopotamia as somewhat unsavory uh, characters. And uh, of course, there's, there's two sides to that. Uh, the city dwellers, they were the ones who raised the large armies that could go and uh, attack people with great force in order to bring them under their control or under the control of their rulers or their kings. We need to dip back for a moment, maybe into uh, chapter three briefly to uh, get at some of this uh, historical tension so if you look up in verse 21 of Genesis 3, you'll notice how God clothed Adam and Eve. See, it says. 23? So, yeah, yeah, so uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse... Um, 23? Uh, verse 21, excuse 21. me. 21, oh, okay. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Okay, garments of skin. Now, it's often said that in order to make the garments of skin of animals, God would have had to kill the animals and that this was uh, portraying that, that Christ would have to die so that humans could be clothed spiritually. You know, I'm not going to say that that's uh, maybe not uh, present there uh, symbolically. It was, I certainly can't uh, uh, prove that it's not. I, I just don't think that's, that's uh, kind of front and center. Uh, there is this connotation with people that were garments of skin as being those again who dwelled on the fringes of society and the fringes of civilization and in this case it's sort of the mark of being an exile uh, of not having a settled home uh, which would be the situation of adam and eve spiritually they would have to sort of be you know dwelling on the fringes of god's uh, own presence and be uh, uh, rootless, as it were, in, in that spiritual sense. To, to get at this, turn to the book of Hebrews for a moment. So, Hebrews chapter 11, and it's talking about the servants of God as being those who endured mistreatment, exile difficulty like uh, Moses, you know, that we have sort of the, uh, what's called the, the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, where many persons of faith in the Old Testament, or what are called the Old Testament saints, sometimes where they are uh, uh, portrayed here in Hebrews chapter 11. But look at verses 36 and 37. May, if you could read those for us. And others experience mockings and scourging. Yes, also the chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with sword. They went about in ship skins and in goat, in goat skins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. Okay, so notice how they were dressed. It says they went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. That all goes together. <laughs> in other words, not being uh, clothed in the woven fabrics like linen of the uh, city-dwelling peoples, but being dwell, be being clothed in you know a herdsman's attire, so to speak, was a mark of being unsettled, of having to exist on like I, like I said on the margins. You remember that John the Baptist was clothed in a rough, you know, a, 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 a woven garment, but one of very rough camel hair. I think it was like like uh, Elijah was. And he lived on the fringe, literally out in the fringes, in the desert, uh, Judean desert, where it meets the Jordan River. So that would be an example. But being dressed in skins was kind of this mark of an exiled, marginal existence. So we do see in Cain and Abel uh, a, a certain amount of that tension coming through because they end up at odds. Now it's 
Sometimes it's said that the offering of Cain was inappropriate because he brought the fruit of the ground. But when you look at the law of Moses, there were many, there were grain offerings, you know, that were made. Uh, there were offerings of produce, uh, the uh, of first fruits of uh, orchards and so on. They were offered. In other words, it, it wasn't necessarily inappropriate to make offerings of vegetable products, it doesn't really say, it doesn't really uh, give us an indication of why uh, uh, God rejected Cain and Abel. It seems to be more a matter of heart attitude mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when we look in other places in the Bible, uh, God rejected the sacrifice of those whose heart was not really uh, toward him in faithfulness. And so uh, the other thing about this is that God seems to uh, reach out to Cain and invite Cain to make a choice as to, we might say, what to do with his anger. Um, he does not seem to leave it as a, a foregone conclusion that uh, Cain is doomed to attack his brother. Um, uh, like he says, God literally leaves him with a, a question, or at the very least, a, a suggestion about him mastering the ill feeling that he feels toward his brother, but of course he does not. Mm. And in verse 8, um, the result of it, um, may if you, uh, you could go ahead and read verse 8 for us. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Okay, just uh, an interesting note um, about uh, verse eight, where it says Cain told, this is from the uh, NASB, New American Standard Bible, Cain told Abel his brother, period, and it came about. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it's a strange sentence that doesn't entirely make sense. Cain told Abel his brother, what did he tell him? Mm. In Hebrew, everything I've read is, I'm not going to be uh, claim to be an expert at Hebrew at all. I don't speak Hebrew, but I've read many comments from Hebrew scholars on verse 8. There are a few who think that it makes sense in Hebrew and try to word it in English in such a way that it makes sense in English, like he told Abel his brother to go out in the field which when they were in something like that but it, it seems like the predominant uh, uh, opinion about this is that it's not clear what T Cain told his brother it's something that caused them to go out in the field so some Bibles insert uh, a, a, a sentence Cain told Abel and his brother, let's go out in the field and it just insert it in English to try to make it make better sense. But it seems to be a kind of suggestive fragment that leaves us wondering a bit about what exactly he did say, except that it's something that led to them being in the field. And then he rises up and uh, Cain kills his brother Abel. So for one thing, it's a story of sin emerging very quickly and its deadly consequences that it leads to death here and it does as I said it foreshadows maybe the uh, conflict that always that, that tended to take place or the tension that did exist between those who were herdsmen and those who were uh, 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 farmers mm -hmm. And in fact, each depended on the other in the ancient Near East, but they also would negotiate with each other and sometimes apparently come away with some resentment uh, that occasionally boiled over in, in, in different ways. So some foreshadowing of larger uh, uh, historical trends uh, in the, the ancient Near East. Hmm. How are we doing on our time? Uh, so, nine minutes more. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's close with prayer. Okay. So, Father, um, we thank you for the advice we received and the guidance that we received through the scriptures in the power of your Holy Spirit to understand what we read. Help us to apply it and uh, guide and direct us until we're together again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
All right, and we'll look for you next time.